Thank you so much, Jeff. That was great. Up next, we have Paul Davies and Kimberly Bussey. Uh, Paul is a uh, Regents Professor at Arizona State University, as well as the Director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, and the Co-Director of the Arizona State University, University Cosmology Initiative. And Dr. Bussey is a cancer cytogeneticist and a bioinformation helping oncologists integrate genomics into medical data to realize the promise of precision medicine for patients. Welcome both of you. Good time. Um, as you can now tell, uh, I'm going to be sharing this presentation with my collaborator, Kim Bussey, so you get two for the price of one, uh, but it does mean that we've got to uh, move it along uh, very carefully. So I'm going to talk uh, for the first uh, 12 minutes or so, then Kim will pick it up and then we'll take some uh, questions. Uh, well, we wouldn't uh, be here, wouldn't be attending this conference if cancer wasn't such a stubborn disease. Uh, I want to argue, uh, I think you would agree, uh, that uh, the reason for that is because cancer is deeply embedded in the very logic of life itself. It's an inevitable byproduct of multicellularity. And I think you'll see a lot of overlap uh, between the presentations of uh, Jim Shapiro and Henry Heng uh, in what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so Kim, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so uh, I think we skipped over one, actually, uh, but never mind. Uh, I'll come back. That's right. It's easily done. Um, uh, so I'm a theoretical physicist, as you briefly heard, and so uh, when I'm approaching problems, for example, in cosmology, uh, I like to go right back to the fundamentals to ask the most basic questions. And so when it comes to cancer, uh, I realize that it is a disease to be conquered, but in uh, my interest lies with what is cancer as a biological phenomenon. It is the most studied phenomenon in biology, uh, and we want to answer the question, well, what is cancer? Why does it exist in the first place? And what is its place in the great story of, of life on Earth? Uh, and next slide uh, shows uh, just symbolically that I think cancer is a, is a window on the past. Studying cancer tells us something about life in our deep past. Uh, so it provides that window. Uh, and we have to look through that window to come up with a full understanding now, why do I say this? Well, in the next slide, uh, this is uh, produced by uh, my ASU colleague, Athena Actipis, and her collaborators. Uh, this shows cancer across all multicellular species. Uh, there's not enough time to go into the full details there, uh, but uh, by and large, what it shows is that cancer is found uh, in, pretty much in um, or cancer or cancer-like phenomena pretty much uh, across the board. And in the next slide, you'll see uh, just uh, representing uh, fish uh, or, or mammals, uh, birds, reptiles, uh, insects, uh, even uh, corals, and, uh, and cancer-like phenomena in some plants. Uh, it, we have a particular fondness in Arizona for this uh, particular cancer. Uh, this is uh, what is known as a, a fasciated uh, cactus. And uh, it, it is a cancer-like phenomenon, uh, rather, rather beautiful. These are collector's items. And uh, at ASU, we even have a special cancer garden that uh, features some of these uh, as a way of getting people to think about cancer as a fascinating biological phenomenon, as well as something that we need to understand and control better. Uh, now, if you uh, find that uh, the, an example of uh, cancer or of any biological phenomenon across many, many species, uh, even species as simple here as uh, Hydra, which has very few cell types, so this is not a very complex organism, uh, and yet there are examples uh, of cancer that have been found there, uh, in this case studied by uh, uh, by uh, a, a German group, uh, D Domas, I can never pronounce it properly, D Domaze, Domaze, I apologize, uh, Lozo uh, in, uh, in Germany. 
uh, if you if you see cancer across many species, including very simple uh, species like this, it suggests very deep evolutionary roots. Uh, and we must always remember uh, Dobzhansky's dictum uh, that uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, and that is uh, our take on the origin of cancer. Uh, we have to trace its uh, deep evolutionary roots and understand uh, why it exists. Uh, multicellularity evolved uh, several times actually between about one and a half billion and uh, 600 million years ago uh, in, it, in its various forms. And so if we are uh, tracing cancer across the tree of life back to some sort of common root, then we're going back not just millions of years uh, or even uh, tens of millions of years, but uh, literally uh, hundreds of, of millions of years. Um, and uh, rather than seeing uh, a malignancy, malignancy as a consequence of uh, Darwinian microevolution driven by stochastic mutations, it can be considered the result of a programmed response illicitly accessed by a few key mutations. Uh, this program appears to have been imprinted uh, through evolution to cope with DNA damage and stored in the evolutionary memory of the genome. And uh, you may have heard those words before because Jim Shapiro was quoting the paper by Aaron Prizer and Craig, uh, Three Steps to the Immortality of Cancer Cells. Uh, and that uh, pretty much uh, expresses our take on this subject. Uh, the way we like to uh, put it is that cancer is the re-expression of an ancestral phenotype, but sort of atav atavism or throwback in as much as uh, uh, the uh, ability of cells and tissues to develop cancer is something that is deeply embedded and has been for hundreds of millions of years. And that's what makes it so hard to shift. Uh, I um, have a, a particular uh, analogy that I sometimes use, which is that cancer is a, a little bit, a bit like safe mode on a computer. You know, if you do something bad to your computer, if you insult it in some way, uh, it will often start up in this uh, horrible manner and you don't quite know what to do. Um, what, what's happening there is that it's running on its core functionality. It's defaulting back to the, uh, to the basics. And I think of cancer is very much the same way. It's a, a response uh, to some sort of uh, insult or a dangerous uh, microenvironment. Uh, and that uh, cancer are, uh, represents cells running on their ancient core functionality. And the more recently evolved, uh, as it were, bells and whistles of uh, evolution uh, get discarded as a result of that. So cancer is therefore a type of uh, atavism back to the uh, simpler unicellular origin. Cells, uh, somatic cells in multicelled organisms haven't forgotten their unicelled uh, origins. Um, now, this is not uh, a, a particularly new idea. If we have the next uh, slide. Um, it uh, goes uh, back 100 years to, uh, to Bovary who uh, wrote the following. I regard it as beyond doubt that the tendency to multiply indefinitely is a primeval property of cells. And he, he goes on to comment that if the regulatory mechanisms uh, are disrupted, then uh, this change may well be enough to induce an altruistic cell to revert to its egoistical mode and thus release its multiplication from restraint. Well, that's an elegant way of saying that, uh, that cells will cheat. Um, and uh, we now, uh, 100 years on, have a powerful new tool to test this theory uh, that cancer represents a reversion back to this uh, simpler unicellular ancestry. Uh, and that's because we can now measure the ages of genes. We can look at cancer genes and ask, how old is that gene? And this is a field called phylostratigraphy. I'll say a few words about it in a moment. So if we look at the great sweep of, of life on Earth, which Again, we think um, at least three and a half billion years ago, for most of that time, uh, life was unicellular. And uh, single cell organisms have really just one imperative, replicate, replicate, replicate. Uh, in a sense, they are immortal. Uh, in multicelled organisms, uh, things are done very differently. Uh, immortality is still uh, there, 
but it's outsourced to the jam line. And the somatic cells, uh, as part of the price they pay for joining that uh, arrangement, is apoptosis. Uh, I, I think of this as like an ancient contract going back hundreds of millions of years, a contract between individual cells and the organism or the germline, really, uh, more appropriately. Uh, but of course, there is always a problem about cheating. An individual cell may decide to gain the advantage of belonging to the collective, uh, but uh, to avoid uh, cheating, there has to be layer upon layer of regulatory control. Uh, and if uh, the control there is in any way compromised, then of course, uh, uh, what happens is a breakdown of that ancient contract and uh, cancer results. Cells revert to their inner uh, pre-programmed selfish ancestral behavior. They make a bid for immortality and pre-programmed is the term. So uh, if we could move this on, uh, then um, uh, I, uh, I I'm, not, I'm never sure whether I'm seeing the slide uh, on the screen uh, correctly, uh, but there, there are really, uh, when it comes to multicellularity, five uh, central uh, foundations. And this again is the work of, uh, of uh, Athena Actipis and her colleagues. Uh, and these are um, several types of, of cooperation, uh, proliferation inhibition, controlled cell death, I've mentioned resource allocation, division of labor, and creation and maintenance of the extracellular environment. And these are the things which go wrong in cancer. So we need to move this along, we're running out of time. Um, I, uh, uh, the, the key thing about our theory is it makes some specific predictions that gene ages will be a key factor in cancer incidence and progression. Uh, and the cancer should show a transcriptional shift towards unicellularity. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll just deal with those two points. Let's have the next slide. Um, and so this is the subject of phyllostratigraphy, which is pioneered by uh, the already mentioned Tomislav Domazet Lozo and Dieter Tots. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, and uh, this is a sample of, of their paper. Uh, well, if you apply uh, phyllostratigraphy to um, oncogenes, it reveals a large peak around the origin of multicellularity, which you can see uh, just briefly in the next slide. Uh, the one with the graph uh, here, um, there we are. Uh, and uh, uh, there are two peaks, one around the origin of, of cellular life, one around the origin of multicellularity. Uh, and this, uh, if we could go on, this technique of phyllostratigraphy um, was used to test, specifically to test the atavism by Anna Trigos and her colleagues uh, at uh, David Good's lab at the Peter Mac Cancer Research Center uh, in Melbourne. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see that they uh, divided up uh, species into uh, 16 different uh, bins there, ranked by their complexity. And uh, what they found, you'll see in the next slide, I'm galloping through this because we have so little time. Um, and they, uh, they found, well, among human genes, about 40% date from the unicellular time and 60% from multicellular time. Uh, and in the next slide, uh, we see, well, this is just a symbolic way of saying that compared to normal, <coughs> cancer increases the proportion of the transcriptome coming from the unicellular genes. Uh, next slide, uh, just showing some of their data across different cancer types. I think these uh, technical details will speak for themselves. You can go back to the original uh, papers if you wish to see. Uh, next slide, the, the tyranny of the clock, I'm afraid. Um, the, the interesting thing, really, the last point I want to make um, is that uh, Trigos and her colleagues found uh, that cancer initiation of progression uh, isn't simply just a continuous slide back in time, a, a reversion or a throwback to an ancestral phenotype. It actually involves a decoupling between the unicellular and the multicellular gene networks. Uh, we, um, uh, we had a, a further uh, prediction at the beginning of this theory, uh, which is that 
as cancer progresses, that is, it goes through different stages, uh, we think that it may, in some cases, at least revert uh, to earlier and earlier gene expression. And they tested this idea by looking at uh, prostate cancer. And you'll see here uh, with the Gleason score how, um, indeed, the uh, higher Gleason score cancer correlates with earlier gene ages. I apologize for the gallop, but this is the point that I'm going to hand over to uh, Kim. And I hope I haven't shortchanged you. I think maybe 30 seconds. Uh, no, I you. should be fine. So um, I'm going to talk more in depth about the three predict about the next of these three predictions. So um, younger genes should be enriched in mutations in cancers. Genes that are causally involved in cancer should be older than the emergence of complex multicellularity six million years ago. And cancer should employ unicellular stress responses. And I'm going to describe some of the evidence for them that we have. So in 2017, we published a study where instead of looking at gene expression and gene age, we looked at mutation. In cancer, genes that have more mutations than we would expect are enriched in younger ages that correspond to dates after the evolution of complex multicellularity. However, when we look at genes that are causally implicated in cancer, as compiled by COSMIC, we see that mutations are underrepresented among young genes. So while younger genes are mutated more often in cancer, the mutation in those genes does not appear to be causal in cancer. Furthermore, cosmic genes, whether the, in cosmic genes, whether the phenotype is dominant or recessive is also associated with gene age. Cosmic genes that have a dominant phenotype are younger than those that have a recessive phenotype. This was an interesting observation. So we asked the question, what sort of functional enrichment do we have between dominant and recessive genes? And there was nothing consistent among the dominant genes. It was very dependent upon the background uh, set of genes that we compared it to. However, when we looked at the recessive genes, we see that they are enriched in DNA repair and cell cycle control and that this was independent of the background list used for comparison. The DNA repair genes that are mutated as we dug further into this are ones that regulate the sensing of DNA damage and the choice of repair pathways to fix it. During the time that we were doing this work, I heard Susan Rosenberg talk about her group's work on adaptive mutation fueled by a stress-induced mutation response. As a reminder, when bacteria are faced with DNA damage that includes double strand breaks while also being under environmental stresses sufficient to induce the SOS response, RPOS, and the membrane protein response, they switch to using DNA polymerase IV, which is encoded by DIN-B as the replicative enzyme. This activity results in amplifications and clusters of mutations around double strand breaks with a distinct spatial distribution in the genome. In humans, the translesion DNA polymerases are orthologous to DIN-B. So has cancer switched back to using stress-induced mutagenesis? This is an example of a karyotype from a malignant pediatric germ cell tumor. It has both numerical abnormalities denoted by the orange arrows and several structural abnormalities shown by the red arrows. These structurally rearranged chromosomes are a record of double strand DNA breaks where repair didn't restore a normal chromosome. Over to the right, you can see how a cytogeneticist describes this abnormal karyotype in writing. I want to draw your attention to this CP7, which indicates that this abnormal karyotype is a composite of all the abnormalities seen in seven cells. More importantly, it means that no two cells looked exactly alike. Structural heterogeneity is associated with resistance to several compounds in the NCI developmental therapeutic screening data for the NCI 60. So from the cytogenetic data, we have evidence of ongoing double strand breaks, which confers a potential fitness advantage under treatment. Given this, we hypothesize that cancer is redeploying stress-induced mutagenesis. <clears throat> 
we weren't the only ones. The idea that cancer is employing stress-induced mutagen stress mutagenesis has additional support. Three papers published in the past year all implicate stress-induced mutagenesis and adaptive mutation in cancer's response to therapy and provide evidence that the mechanism is tied to the activity of translesion polymerases. If this is true, then there should be a telltale sign in the genomic data. Remember that I said that stress-induced mutagenesis leaves behind a cluster of mutations with a particular spatial distribution around double-strand breaks. The genomic signal we are after is in the shape of mutational clusters observed in tumors. Luis Cisneros and I developed a way to look at how NS SNVs are distributed within a cluster. If they are uniformly distributed, as in the top, then the score is close to zero. If they show a tendency to be toward the center and not at the ends in the middle figure, then the score is positive. If they are at the ends, the score is negative. In bacteria, stress-induced mutagenesis results in clusters with distributions like the middle panel. If stress-induced mutagenesis is active in cancer, we should see positive cyst scores. And positive cyst scores are exactly what we see. Furthermore, we evaluated the role of different mutational mechanisms in contributing to that score and the shape of the clusters we observed in whole genome sequencing data from PCOG. We computed the overall CIF scores using only SNVs with an assigned mechanism. In this analysis, mechanism is assigned based on having specific wild-type contexts and the corresponding mutations for the polymerases where this particular combination of wild-type and mutant leads to an unambiguous assignment. This means this is a conservative analysis. As you can see, the overall CIS score is best recapitulated by those SMBs that can be attributed to translesion synthesis polymerase activity. A similar pattern is seen in the data from David Thomas's group from the experiments where they used treatments that did not target DNA and selected for resistance. We see clusters with shapes indicative of stress-induced mutagenesis, and translesion synthesis is the most likely mechanism contributing to that. The CIS score has clinical implications. The score can be computed by taking all clusters into account all at once, representing the average shape of a mutational cluster in a tumor, or by computing a score for each individual cluster separately. In this latter case, we can look at the interquartile range representing the middle 50% of the cluster shapes. When we look at overall SIF, we see that in primary tumors, more peaked, i.e. more positive CIS scores actually confer better survival. However, the inverse is true in recurrent or metastatic tumor samples. In these samples, large CIS scores predict worse survival. When we look at cluster shape heterogeneity as measured by the Sith IQR, we lose the distinction between primary and metastatic disease. A large IQR, which indicates lots of cluster shape heterogeneity, predicts poor patient survival. And the effect is strong enough that if we divide the data at the median IQR, we still see a survival difference. So I want to end my portion of the talk with a nod to the therapeutic implications of what we have discussed. Single cells evolve to survive. If cancer is single cell behavior, then adaptability is a selectable trait. The take no prisoners approach will apply a strong selective pressure that will select for adaptability and thus resistance. To take advantage of adaptability, we should think about what multicellularity buys a cell and create therapies that select for those behaviors rather than selecting against unicellular behavior. To do this effectively, we need a way to characterize tumors that takes into account both their adaptive potential and the host's potential of available cancer defenses. And with that, Paul and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you for such an interesting and, and uh, data full talk. Um, I have a, 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 a question. Uh, 
what about targeting the uh, mutagenic capabilities directly? Would they provide a useful uh, targets for uh, therapy? Kim, you're going to take that one. Sure. Um, my prediction is that that is certainly worth trying, but since these adapt and there are multiple translesion synthesis polymerases, um, unless you're going to target all of them all at once which is likely to be highly toxic because these things do very important things. These polymerases are important for our normal tissue. Um, I think that we're gonna get a point where it would be great, but we just don't have a therapeutic window. But the regulation of them might be uh, more, more uh, might be simpler. Maybe. Um, I think that this argues that we actually need, so I didn't show it, but we see um, evidence of these clusters and with positive cyst scores of the same shape in normal tissue as well. So I, I, we've got to figure out what it's doing in the multicellular context before we start saying, well, can we target it um, in this unicellular context and not induce more problems than we solve. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions on the chat? I, I, I don't see any. Paul, so one other? of the questions on the chat is, can the same analysis, young versus old genes, be applied to epigenetic changes? If somebody can give me a list, yes. Yes, I, I'm sure. I'm sure that's uh, true myself. Yeah. I can uh, just read this one question for for you, James. Uh, Vincent Ling asks: In studies that I've read, uh, are we creating radiation resistant E. coli as the bacteria evolved to be more radio resistant? the less fit the mutant progeny became to survive in normal environment in the normal environment because pathways were were diverted but in cancer this doesn't happen um that's the comment uh could you what do you think about that my, my first thought is that uh, the, the basic idea here is that uh, we, we are reverting from multi-celled uh, organization and control back to single-celled uh, E. coli, of course, uh, unicellular to start off with. Uh, the further insult to unicellularity, uh, I'm not sure I have anything to say on that uh, front. How about you, Kim? Um, I think part of it is also that, that the selective pressures you can apply to E. coli for radio resistance um, you run into toxicity with that in patients. So part of the reason we don't see it in cancer may just simply be because we can't apply a strong enough selective pressure over time for it. Um, I don't know that anybody has tried those experiments. I'd be interested to know if anybody else knows um, in vitro in a model system, um, because if they have, then that would be an interesting look to ask the, the question of how far can you push a cancer cell into radio resistance and how badly does that then impact their um, fitness when they're in a, a normal tissue environment? Well, it's, it's interesting that in that regard that the, the uh, polyploid cells, and maybe we'll hear about this tomorrow, uh, are much more radio resistant because they're not actively dividing. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say about the, the E. coli, the, the, uh, the repair functions are all controlled by the, the rec a uh, path system so that the, they're not uh, uh, deleterious to normal growth. They're, they're activated when they're needed. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much for all that. Interesting work. I'm sorry we had to compress uh, so much uh, data into such a little amount of time, but uh, well, the, the, Thank you. the publication will give people an opportunity to see that at more leisure uh, later on.